Praise me, bitches. I am Insane Lane, and today we are checking out Hulu, The Handmaid's Tale, Episode 8, Jezebel's Warning. I've been waiting a long time for this. Ranting can occur at any time, so be prepared. And for now, let's break it down. We open with June and Nick together again. She's coming to terms with the fact that Luke is alive, and what does that mean to her? She has few insight-type thoughts. Whether they're accurate or not, I leave to you. I kind of... Uh, I disagree more than I agree, I think. But what it comes down to is this. I'm here because it feels good. And because I don't want to be alone. We get some backstory on Nick, and he's a general screw-up. That is all. He then gets recruited by Shady trying to overthrow the government guy who starts promising him a better life. We get some good background on the Sons of Jacob. I think this is the first time we're hearing their name. This is what would become the government of Gilead, so good to know where they started. Um, though they seem to be pretty far along here, they're already very powerful, they have chapters in many states, and this guy is personally ahead of one of those chapters, so he's a pretty powerful guy. And he wants Nick to be his personal spy. Hi. How's my fair little one this evening? Yeah, I'd freeze too. What the fuck is he doing here? If anyone sees him, it's her that'll get the blame. And wow, is he in full dick mode with just a dash of asshole and a heaping helping of cat and mouse. I really hate him this episode. Him shaving her legs is interesting. Why would he care, for one? Why would he insist on doing it himself? Why not just give her the razor and, you know, let her do it? Unless he's worried she's gonna, like, slit her wrists or something, which I don't think he is at this point. And he treats this so much like a fetish. I'm surprised he can even stand up afterwards. Doesn't that feel nice? He's good at this. He's done it before. His ego and voyeurism are also on full display as he watches her put on makeup, controlling every little thing and clearly enjoying himself just way too much. Then the big reveal of the dress. Few things here. How did he get it? Where did it come from? How did this start for him? This whole turning the handmaids into whores and Jezebels and that whole thing. Like, he, we know he's done this before with at least one handmaid, but how many times? Like, did they have a regular thing of going to Jezebel's? Did he only do it the one time and then she killed herself? That's my popular theory. Um, does Rita know about any of this? I think it would be very hard for her to not know. I mean, yeah, it's a big house. It is, but it's a house of silence. And just because we don't see her doesn't mean she disappears. She lives in that house, too. She has to be there somewhere. And high heels on wooden floors? Where are we going? You don't want me to spoil the surprise, do you? Gaddy's a dick, and I don't care about Nick's moping face. Okay? In the car, I like that he's trying to impress her. He's saying, look, we tore down housing complexes and built a park. Because that's what society needs. That's just so useful. They make it through one checkpoint just fine using Serena's cloak and ID, but at a second one, she has to hide. I'm gonna have to ask you to get down. Past the gateway, wives aren't even allowed. I have so many questions about this. He said Serena Joy went to visit her mother, fine, but unless her mother lives within like a 10 minute drive, how did she manage this? And if her mother is that close, why is she spending the night? Moving on, the commander is really showing off how insensitive he is when he says he wants to be told how much she's enjoying herself. In other words, she's not stroking his ego the way he feels he deserves for giving her this oh-so-grand outing. He is completely oblivious to her fear, which goes very well with the character. It's fine. It fits. I, but, I mean, she's the one who's likely to be shot here if they're discovered. He should kind of know that and maybe keep that in mind as to why she would be acting a little off. Also, she's been told all these places, all these things, women like this, they don't exist anymore because it's not good for society. And she thought he upheld all that shit. 
So now she gets to see him for what a hypocrite he is, and that the whole system is just complete bullshit, and all that she suffers for it is bullshit. I'd be a little stunned too. This scene is oh so important, so let's listen closely here. It's not rocket science. All remaining fertile women should be collected and impregnated by those of superior status, of course. Talking about concubines. I don't care what you want to call it. Okay, where to even start? Let's start with Price, the religious one. He wants all the window dressing and everything to be very godly. Okay, fine. The other guy in the car is the practical one. It's all a numbers game to him. It's breeding stock and nothing more. Okay. And then we have our commander. He's like the middle child here. He's the one who's got to play peacekeeper and make these two work together and get it done. And if I wasn't already wishing that their car would blow up, this line really does it. The wives would never accept it. Well, that's a non-issue. And I have a new contender for dick of the episode. The self-awareness here is really something. These men know the evils that they propose. And they mean to go forward with it. I get a good read on why two of them are in this car. Price is religious guy, okay? He believes that the infertility is the wrath of God, and therefore if we all become more godly, blah 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 blah, fine. Guthrie, as the other one is called, and I may be confusing their names, and I may continue to do so, is all about power and control. He doesn't give a damn about the religious stuff. It's a practical matter for him. It's survival and how do I make the best life for myself and screw over anyone else that I have to. This leaves our commander has a serious question. Why is he here? How did he get in touch with these people? How did he come to be high enough up that he is sitting in this car having this conversation, making these decisions? I do like that he's the one who says it's about marketing. It's about optics. How do we sell this idea? This is what we need to do practically for survival. But we need to wrap it up in the religious packaging and sell it to the people somehow, or we're going to have mass riots and civil war that'll never stop. Now, they did have some riots and some protesting, and they are still at a civil war. Hello, kitty. And so I'm not sure how well the marketing aspect seems to have worked, but it worked well enough because they are in power, and what they said here is happening. So maybe he was more important than I think? But we haven't seen him be important yet, which is a little, is a little off for me. You know, he's the, he's the guy who doesn't feel like he belongs there. Um, I like that they arrive via this service elevator. This is a secret forbidden place that isn't supposed to exist. And even in this place of all the broken rules, the commander is breaking the rules. He himself could get in trouble for this. He is taking something of a risk at this point. I also love that the dress doesn't quite fit. That kind of attention to detail is something that makes any show just so much better. I can't play it for obvious reasons, but listen to the song that plays as they're entering Jezebel's. It is perfection. It's called White Rabbit, and this version is by Jefferson Airplane. It's been around a long time, and you might recognize it from uh, the Resident Evil movies. It was used in the first one uh, over the credits and got uh, quite a lot of recognition for it. Um, I love that um, the song uses uh, Alice in Wonderland as kind of the backdrop and like being on a massive drug trip, which is awesome. Um, the line, go ask Alice, you know, plays a few times, and basically... Alfred is Alice here. She's gone through the looking glass from what she knows as her world into this bizarro topsy-turvy land <laughs> that isn't just like, you know, everything from before. This is everything from before, like, on steroids. This is fetishism to the max. This is depravity to the max. This is everything that is not supposed to exist. It would be very, very off-putting. I also like that the music gets turned up. You can't hear anything except the music. The commander is talking to her and she's not hearing. I love that because it's so real. She's so blown away and just, what is this place and these clothes and there's booze and what the fuck? That she's not even like processing what he's saying. 
it's just oh the whole scene the whole entrance is just the reveal of the place is just awesome they did not disappoint and i'm so glad gilead is all about purity and devotion to god sexual repression and removing sin this place is a sin palace it is oozing in it one look around the room you have voyeurism lust fetishism drugs alcohol fornication about a dozen kinds of fetishism i don't see any bibles in this room hell i don't even see a hooker dressed as a nun there ain't nothing godly about this place now let's get you a drink one more part wouldn't look right if you did did you see that watch it again as they walk up to the bar look at the top right of the screen What football game is that? Where in Gilead is there football? Is this satellite from another country? I don't think so for oh so many reasons. Is it a tape of an old game? Maybe, but why bother? Is it just plain a mistake? Probably. I'm guessing the game was on wherever they filmed this and just nobody noticed. All women who couldn't assimilate. That one there, she's a sociology professor, or she was. We've got lawyers, a CEO, a few journalists. I'm told you can have quite a good conversation with some of them if why you feel like us talking. We've got quite a collection. They prefer it here. Oh, yeah. A CEO, a sociology professor, and a lawyer. I'm sure they're very happy being government hookers for a bunch of hypocritical douchebags. And then it happens. Yes! It's my girl! Moira is alive! And she signals June to use their old trick of meet me in the bathroom. They don't get more than a few words before they're being oh so rudely interrupted by an aunt. But hello, there's aunts here? What do they think of this? Does that mean they tell the other aunts about this place? Or are they like prisoners here too, just in a different way? I really want to know. And I really want to know how ants are chosen and trained, because presumably they're not allowed to read either. So are they given, like, entirely verbal instruction? That seems, like, really inefficient and counterproductive and uh, impossible to keep, like, any kind of consistency. We then see Nick in the kitchen, and he is probably the supply line for all things contraband in the Waterford household. Because he's trading for some booze from Russia, who will trade with anybody, and hair dye, of all things. Because apparently the wives like it. How would you keep that a secret? I've dyed my hair. It fucking reeks to high heaven. And it doesn't smell just while you're doing it. Your hair will smell for days, no matter how much you wash it. And the change in color would be, I don't know, noticeable? It just seems a very odd thing to put in there. Nick is trading a large bag of drugs and pregnancy tests. Where the fuck did he get those from? We also learn he's been fucking this Martha too. Skank. And I mean Nick. We're told one thing I find oh so interesting and could be important. That the men have cell phones and that sometimes, after the guys fall asleep or if the girls roofie the guys, the girls get a hold of the cell phones and can use them. How... How is this a thing? Do the phones only work if you're calling within Gilead? Do they not have, like, long distance? Do they not have internet access? You can't, like, go on Facebook and say, I'm being held captive here, somebody please save me for the love of God? I, I really want to know. Because what would be the point of having the phone if you couldn't contact someone on the outside or social media or actual media or someone, anyone? Who would you call if you're one of these girls? Like, are you calling the room next door on another girl? You wouldn't know anyone else's cell phone number. Are you just going to call random numbers you find in the contacts? I don't think so. Selfies? Why do they want the phones? What can they do with them? What good are they? Why is it allowed? I need answers to things like this. Offred pulls her shit together, and the commander takes her upstairs while Nick stares and looks like a demented stalker while remembering what happened last time. As I've said, I highly suspect that she did this after being taken to Jezebel's for the first time, that seeing the hypocrisy of it and the pointlessness of what she was suffering broke her and she hung herself. 
and Nick is worried June will do the same. Everyone's reactions to her death is very, very telling. Nick feels responsible. To Rita, it's a tragedy. To Serena Joy, it's an inconvenience. And to the commander... I'm not so sure. Of everyone there, he should feel the most responsible and guilty, and yet he clearly does not because he's still playing the same games. What do you think of our little club? Now we get a scene that's apparently very true to life. Many high-class escorts and paid companions have said that nine times out of ten, what men really want is a therapist. They want someone to listen to them. Tonight it's all about the other commanders. Who's scheming, who's plotting, who can he trust, who can he not trust, who's an idiot? He also mentions purges in other districts, but that's all we get on that, so I'm not really... That could mean a lot of things, so I'm really not sure what he means by that. But he does say that he feels like he's a target, like other people within the administration might be plotting to take him down to gain more power for themselves, implying that he is a lot more powerful than I initially thought. And it seems that internal power struggles are the way of it here, backstabbing and you know, moving up by taking someone else down, it's all very Roman Colosseum. And the commander is in full bitch mode again, so it's a good thing June is here to listen to him bitch. You do understand me, don't you? Yeah, have another glass of bourbon, buddy. And then he's back to wanting to be praised about how great the club is and how great he is for bringing her here. And then he slithers around her like a very rapey snake and slowly takes off the dress and rapes her in the hotel room. You know, I guess he thinks the chains of scenery makes it not rape. He really needs to use one of those dictionaries in his office. Afterwards, she sneaks out and goes to find Moira. And again, I love the walk down the hall. It's so perfect. I can't show you what she's looking at, given what this place is, but I can describe it. And what she is shocked to see is two women in costumes, one dressed as a handmaid, one as a wife, and they're in positions like the ceremony, only the handmaid is um, making out with the wife on her knees while a guy is doing her from behind, doggy style, and like three other guys are in chairs watching. It's really, really sick, on any level. She finds Moira, and we get to hear what happened to her. After they finished their questions, they gave me a choice, the colonies or Jezebels. It was a few good years before your pussy was out. All the booze and drugs you want, food's good. June's face is so sad here. Her friend, this ideal, this heroine of freedom and rebellion that she's held in her mind all this time. She finds her now, and she's broken. She's given up. Even hearing that Luke got out, that he is out there and alive, changes nothing for her. She puts it very simply. He's out there, and we're in here. And that's it. We then flash back to Nick's early days where he's reporting on Guthrie, one of the guys from the car. He's been sleeping with his handmaid, which seems to be pretty common because of the four commanders that have names, three of them are screwing their handmaids. Maybe they should do something about that. But he's also been laundering money, which is probably the real reason he's getting in trouble. And it seems that that makes Price either the head guy or near to it. He is very, very powerful is what I'm saying. This is apparently just after the first handmaid has killed herself, so not that long ago. And though Price seems to know all about Waterford's crimes and that he was sleeping with the handmaid too, he's not doing anything about it. Mm, why not? Again, the other guy was sleeping with the handmaid and money laundering. He's being arrested for the money laundering. Or embezzlement, I think is what I mean. He's stealing, is my point. But he's getting in trouble for the money, not the sex. And yet... The way Price talks, he's clearly a zealot and devoted believer of his own hype, bullshit, and brand of Bible thumping. I mean, he says we're going to clean up Gilead, and yet he's leaving Waterford alone. He is undeniably the most dangerous of the villains here. You're back. Yes. <laughs> so, how is she? The same. How were things here? Oh, only. Then we have Nick and June in the kitchen, 
where Nick actually has the balls to be angry at her about last night when he knows goddamn well. You know, I had to go with him last night, right? You know, I didn't have a choice. I don't have any choice. He then shows even more of why I don't like him by refusing to speak and just glaring at her like a little schoolboy. She responds with a whole lot of nonsense that I really don't care about and shows how reckless she is getting, perhaps even suicidal because after all there are so many ways to get killed in Gilead. Now this is something. I had it in my bedroom growing up as a child. I thought you might like it. There's a key. Firstly, why is Serena Joy being nice? I never trust her when she's being nice. I never trust her in general. But when she's nice, I'm extra wary. Why wasn't the music box trash like everything else? Why is it allowed to exist? And it has a lock? Meaning, in theory, she could keep a secret in it. I mean, she does indeed use the key for keeping a secret. <laughs> Made me laugh? The use of the song White Rabbit as the theme for Jezebels. It's perfect. You go, girl, goes to June for throwing Nick's judgmental crap right back in his face. Nitpick. Football on the TV in a land with no football. I really want to know how nobody on the set that day caught that and no one in editing caught that. Ironic feminist. I'm splitting it between Serena Joy... She makes a brief appearance, but the act of giving a child's music box to Alfred is still enough. And sadly, the other winner is Moira for praising the benefits of Jezebel's and suggesting June try to get sent there. Dick of the episode, we have a triple crown award. Commander Guthrie for calling the wives inconsequential. Commander Price for being a dick in general and thinking that women should just be rounded up and impregnated in whatever form. And, of course, to Commander Waterford for the amount of ego and other stroking he demands throughout the episode. And that is episode 8 of Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale, Jezebels. I love that we spend most of our time at Jezebels. We really get a good look at the place. And, of course, I love the return of Moira. Nothing could be more awesome. We get more of her in the last two episodes. And, sadly, yeah, there's only two episodes left, so I'm going to make the most of them. I'm going to have all the fun and do all the ranting and bitching that I want, so look forward to that coming up soon. But for now, that is my review of Episode 8, Jezebel's Blessed Be Bitches. Bye-bye.